Hello, I'm Nick Maida, CEO of Gainsight, and I want to welcome you to Net Dollar Retention Television, the nerdiest TV show on the internet, which is all about customer success and net retention and why it's so existential for any recurring revenue business. Super excited to have my friend and, and a longtime kind of member of the customer success community, Emily McAvoy. Emily is the chief customer officer at a little company called Workday. Most of you know Workday as a true pioneer in SaaS creating initially an incredible suite in human capital management and now much, much more than that. Welcome, Emily. Hey, Nick. Thanks for having me. It's we so made it through the tech difficulties here and we're we're a few minutes late being live, but we made it. Well, it's uh, better late than ever. And on the internet, late is late is, is the same as being on time. It's all the same. <laughs> and it's awesome to see you actually in an office, which is super cool, but you're coming off a of summer. Or kind of it's probably one of the stranger summers we've had in a while, but Hopefully you got to have some fun. What, what what was the funnest thing you got to do this summer? Yeah, we actually um, took a chance and took a trip to the East Coast, um, to the beach in South Carolina. Awesome. Um, with my four kids, my brother has five kids, of, of course, because he's my brother. He had to outdo me. So he has five. <laughs> uh, so I got to spend time with him and my 86-year-old dad um, and enjoy the beach and eat a ton of like really good Southern food, you know, like pimento cheese, fried green tomatoes. I don't know if that grosses you out. Like, I'm not uh, sure if you're a Southern food guy, but. Um. It sounds amazing. And may, maybe not, maybe not like the, the low calorie vegan California diet, but still amazing nonetheless. Uh, so really, really fun. Welcome back. I know your South Carolina uh, roots, which we'll talk about at the end. Uh, so we want to talk about customer success to start. And the real theme of this discussion is how customer success is evolving from this sort of, you know, where people, some people started, which is, hey, make sure the customers are happy make sure they're using the product, make sure they're getting best practices, try to make sure they don't leave, right? And then <laughs> if, if, when in your spare time, maybe they can actually you know do more with our company, right? And now right. Workday is, a, I mean, I'm sure in the time you've been there, it's evolved so much from having, you know, one initial incredible solution to now having this whole portfolio. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the scope of your organization and kind of mm -hmm. what the charter is and also kind of how that's evolved at Workday over time. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I would start by just saying that I feel incredibly lucky to have my role of chief customer officer at a company like Workday. Yeah. Because Workday truly embraces our core values. And we use it as a guidepost for everything we do, how we operate. And on top of that, customer service is a core value. And it's been a core value since day one, since our founding, like 16 years ago. And so yeah. Every Workday employee takes this to heart, which it makes my job so much easier, right? It's not like we have to teach them, you know, how to really feel it um, about how to prioritize customers, right? So the entire company is aligned on how we do the right thing for customers. So that makes my job so much easier, first and foremost. And um, so our organization, and I would say I've been in this chief customer officer role for about 18 months at Workday. I've been at Workday almost 11 years. Amazing. Um, so awesome. a sh short period of time, and I'm in my tenure here. And so our organization includes um, professional services, education services, customer success, support, um, and then services and software alliances. And, um, and Neil Bushery made the decision about 18 months ago you know, to create this chief customer officer role. And one of the things was to, to be able to provide a more seamless experience for our customers in their journey. So we were getting feedback that, hey, you're doing a, you know, we like how you're optimizing, you know, this and this and this, yeah. but but really your handoffs aren't that great between organizations. And so one of the initial charters of my role was to say, how can we bring this together um, across all these different pieces, all these touch points within the customer journey to really improve that experience for our customers? Um, and so I'd say that's that's the original intention. And then when I took the role 18 months ago, the first thing we did as a team was to create an internal rally cry. Um, which is we want to create experiences that enable lasting customer success and really using that as kind of a top line message um, for our, our employees to think about, you know, our initiatives, um, our goals and how we're going to work with customers. I love that. That's so much to unpack there. You know, one thing that I think uh, a lot of people resonate with is the evolution of the customer success charter. And I, I, you know, I, I've known Workday since actually since we launched Gainsight. And actually, one thing I'll say for sure, the values are real. I can tell. You go visit, you know, back when, when you were allowed to visit people in offices, I, I've been out to your Pleasanton office a whole bunch of times and, and people are really committed, really believe it's, it's very inspirational. Um, but, you know, customer success in 2013, when I first met Workday was extremely different from it is, how it, what it is today. How, how did it evolve over time? Wow, you're right. So different. 
And, you know, here's what I love about the customer success profession is that it has changed. It's so dynamic, right? You've seen yeah. this. It changes so much every single year. Like, you know, I, I grew up in consulting and professional services and, um, you know, you create a very structured project plan, how you get from, you know, start to go live. And there's a certain number of steps and we've evolved that over the years, but not as dramatic about as everything that's involved in customer success. Right. And I think initially we were just focused on relationships and mm -hmm. connecting with customers. And, and a lot of times you'd have to do a, a lot of guesswork and gut feeling on how happy customers were because you had no data. So you're like, I think they're pretty happy, yeah. Depending, yeah. you know, yeah. independent yeah. on who you talk to. Um, and then really it was more about getting them just to go live and then making sure you were connecting with them. You did annual planning reviews with them. How are they using the applications? Where it shifted, in my opinion, it's much more data driven. It's much more connected to, I'm sure we're going to talk about net, net NRR, yeah. like not only ensuring customers are using your applications, but are we setting them up? Um, that that we will be able to um, have the opportunity to sell additional applications to them. And then I think what the pandemic has really shown is your approach needs to be personalized. You have to understand their industry. You have to be able, you have to be empathetic to their industries, understand their specific issues so you can tailor your solutions to that. And so much more pressure to focus on outcomes. It's not enough to just use the applications. It's how can the applications enable the customer's strategy um, what, what, whatever that is, right? Whatever that's the strategy driven by the CFO, the CIO, or the CHRO. You said all the, the buzzwords and CS all together. I did, yeah. Out Do I get points for that? Like, are you attention, I have a whiteboard back here. <laughs> you got them. And, and, but they're real. They're really, I mean, we, we've gotten to know where the work they team, they're real. And it's, I'm going to unpack each of those. So let's start with um, how the company's strategy evolved. Cause I feel like customer success and net retention have to evolve out of the company strategy as an outsider it feels like workday strategy. It probably always was the strategy, but it's externally it went from a the HR technology HCM company to now being so much more than that. How how did the product strategy evolve over the years? Yeah, well, I won't go too deep in that because my partner in crime, Peach, Peach Lamp, who runs our our products organization, wouldn't like that. But what I would say is my observations. And I think it would surprise everyone to know that we've been developing financial applications for nearly as long as HCM applications. I, I remember hearing that. That's right. It was always, <laughs> yeah. part, always part of the plan, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. You know, what's evolved is um, we take a lot of cues from our customers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think early days we would say we'll never do payroll. But then we had a customer come along and say, we really like you to do payroll. And we go yeah. into that area. Right. And so um, just like we are, you know, with customer service being a core value, the other thing that's really important, we we leverage our customers to provide inputs at every part of our business, right? Of course, they heavily influence my business, but we use them to help um, influence how we build products. We make sure we always have a customer voice at the table, so we expand the product footprint based on that. Um, and then we also, in terms of, you know, we've take, up taken quite a few more acquisitions over the past years, right? So we acquired adaptive planning, um, we acquired Scout, which is a procurement yep. application. And then most recently, Pecan, yeah, which right. we feel so lucky, the timing of that. It's an, it's an amazing, beautiful application to gauge your employee experience. How timely is that right now, right, when that's what a lot of us are focused on? Totally. But again, it's market direction, it's customer direction. Um, and as you know, all that, as you're expanding those products, has a huge impact on the customer success organization. Um and we've had to evolve to be able to support those applications, to be able to understand how our, the acquired companies work. And we've also um, made a lot of changes on our sales organization as well. When I started here, we didn't have a customer-based sales organization. Yeah. And we had a renewals team. There was four of us on the renewals team, right? And now, you know, as we progressed, it's, um, you know, those organizations have expanded exponentially. I'm going to come back to several of those points. So we talked about the evolution of Workday's strategy, or not really evolution, the unfolding of the strategy, because it was always the, this strategy. And then um, the evolution of the customer success team and kind of your organization. How did the metrics evolve? And this is when we get into net retention. How, wh what were you looking at, you know, five, six years ago to measure customer success? What were you looking at two years ago? What are you looking at today? Yeah, early days, um, it was all around... Um, measuring, well, let me back up and say, the one thing that I think we've been good at from the beginning is understanding the foundational components that then would ladder up to a, a GRR number or an NRR number, meaning mm -hmm. 
we don't just take those numbers at face value. We really dig into all the components that make up those app, those numbers and the journey across the cust- the journey the customer takes to there. So as an example, you know, we always have measured deployment timeframes. We've always tracked our deployments um, at a granular level to know how our partners are performing. Are they living up to our customers' expectations? So we've always had that really nice baseline. And then when we moved into customer success, um, I would say our metrics were a lot more immature. It was basically, mm-hmm. are the customers in red, yellow, or green? Yep. And what are they live on and what are they not live on? Yep. I mean, that's kind of where it was. Um, Everyone's but obviously, yeah. um, now we've matured much for, we've matured past that. So how can you create a more comprehensive customer health index? Mm-hmm. Look at all, you know, are your customers participating in events? Are they participating in reference calls? What is what does their case volume look like? How quickly are we, are we resolving their cases? Um and then digging into the NRR metrics and seeing where we're seeing leakage, where we're seeing upside, and really understanding that at a much more granular level. Love it. I don't know if that's too broad to-, to that, No, that's great. I'll, I'll unpack some of that because there's probably some things people want to click into there. So the um, so NRR, so now that's the theme of this whole thing. So net retention, and then you've got GRR, which is gross retention, which doesn't include expansion. You know, mm-hmm. you, I'm sure you look at both of those as a business. Uh, you know, do you, are they equally, do you look at them equally Is one more important than the other, or maybe you discuss them in different forums? Yeah, I'd say we discuss them in different forums. I, I prefer, um, NRR. Yep. Um, and because I think that that paints a a nice picture for customers. I think, you know, I listened to one of your podcasts uh, and was, is churn dead. Yeah. Um, We kind of debated that. We think it's in purgatory. (laughs) <laughs> um, no, we, you know, what we're, I think churn really depends. Like if you watch churn kind of depends on your business model. If you are low cost of sale, high volume, you know, shorter contract duration, yeah, exactly. churn makes a ton of sense to pay oh, a lot of attention to. With us, we typically sign three to five contracts. That's the norm. Um, and, um, and we feel like, again, taking care of the basics, we don't have to worry as much as about churn in general, right? I mean, that's a lower, that's a much lower number for us, but it's really, um, we really want to pay attention to, um, you know, a metric, for example, we call it sold, not implemented. So they've, they bought the product, but they haven't turned it on. So we track that and report that up to the senior management team about how we're progressing. If, if, if that's an important metric, you know, and we like to look for, um, you know, a, a part of NRR too is our customers expanding the usage of the product. Are they now, can we help them roll it out globally? Maybe, maybe they're using yeah. it, you know, in a certain country. And so we look at all those metrics um, in, in quarterly business reviews and then talk about which teams can help lean into what particular metrics, right? And that's where, you know, it depends if I'm going to partner with my sa- the sales organization or the products organization right. and how, you know, really understanding um, those nuances within the metric. We take and N- N- NRs, which is a, it's a lot of things inside it. Uh, you know, I'm guessing you probably break it down by, like you said, usage and, and entitlement growth versus new product sale. What, yeah. Are there any other levers that you break that you kind of think about when you decompose? Yeah, it? yeah. So we look at, um, yeah. So it would be any SKU churn, whether you're yeah. adding a new SKU, yeah. um, it's going to be number of seats. You know, there's some, you know, whether it's kind of organic growth that the customer is just growing and then you're you're chewing up off of that. Or there's growth events. Maybe they've acquired a company, and that Absolutely that right. you know, totally. and that that plays into that. Um, in certain cases, there's CPI components, you know, that maybe are built mm-hmm. into contracts that that play into that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other ones that that we account for off the top. CPI of my head. for people watching is kind of uh, your kind of consumer price index. Basically, like, is there a price? Kind of yeah, is there like an inflation index? Up with inflation, right? Yeah, these are good. I think I just t- kind of took down that list. I think understanding what goes into NR is really important because otherwise it's just like a it's like a big ball of wax that there's so many different things in there and and it, you got to decompose it. So, and I'm guessing inside NR, all the work they doesn't really, you know, I, I think you, you guys don't churn as you said, churn isn't something that's as big of a thing. But for other people watching, if you have churn, that's going to bring down your NRR too. So right. That, yeah, headwind on your NRR. So that matter, that matters, you know. Yeah, first and foremost, you have to get your customers live and make sure that they're getting the value out of your solution yeah. before you even worry about NRR because that's right. That's a that's a like that's kind of the key to the SaaS model, right? The virtuous cycle of getting yeah. people in and renewing, um, or else, yeah, you're really going to struggle in driving up, you know, with add-ons of other customers if you're churning customers of similar value. 
And Emily, when you talk about growth, one of the um, where, ways that your customers probably grow is they might start with Workday in you know the Americas, right, in their customer ba- in their employee base, and then go to Europe, or they might start in one bi- business unit and go to another, right? Is, does that happen as well? Where yeah, they- for sure that happens. Um, a lot of times, customers will choose us initially, though, for their global solution, and then just so phase or roll out. Um, with yeah. some of these products that we've acquired, like Adaptive Insights, which is a planning application, that yeah. is very like a, a business-driven application that sends sometimes proliferated through other parts. I think um, the other thing that's been kind of an interesting evolution and a challenge to our, C- our CX team is, you know, maybe we're selling it into the office of the CHRO, like you mentioned, yeah. but we have intentions to sell to the CFO with our financial right. solution and really challenging the teams to broaden their relationships across those different, what we would call buying centers. So, you know, I grew up in HR, so I'm super yeah. comfortable talking to a CHRO, but you know, how can I kind of gain the skills and knowledge to be able to relate to the CFO and help see that opportunity and those relationships for the rest of the company when we're selling to those types of individuals. So that's something, you know, as you expand across your, your buying centers that, that, is, um, that you have to enable your teams to be able to do. Well, I took a note on that as you were describing your org, because I think one question a lot of people wrestle with as they think about NRR, they're often thinking about multiple products. And when thinking about multiple products, you're sometimes thinking about different buying centers. And when you think about multiple products and multiple buying centers, you start saying, can one CSM cover it all? Um, And how do you think, I'm sure you've evolved that a lot over time. How have you thought about that problem? Yeah, well, that is a constant dialogue with us, right? Because it's getting more and more complicated um, every year, I think. And... um, you know, I would say currently we think of having a, a single CSM as a touch point into a customer is really important, right? Yeah. I think from a, a customer wants a simple, easy relationship and knowing yeah. their their person, right? Um, and I, I would say again, I would caveat this: it depends on what segment of the market you're working in, whether it's SMB or medium enterprise or or large enterprise. But in general, having a lead person. And then really giving that CSM the authority to pull in experts as needed to address yeah. those particular topics. I mean, I think it's the same, you know, when you interact with other executives at customer site, or if I'm on a steering committee, I can offer so much value, but not, not everything they're looking for. So I always bring, you know, a partner along to a steering committee that can really address their needs. It's very similar, right? Of how oh, our CSMs need to operate. Oh, 100%. I add very little value. I had to bring people <laughs> in to do the real work. But you're totally right. I mean, that concept is inevitable because otherwise you can't the csm can't know everything but at the same time i think you're trying to balance how do you not have 17 different P- C- csms talking to the same customer mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. And, and part of workday's value prop is an integrated solution stack so you probably want right. an integrated customer experience right yeah we're gonna we're going through an exercise now so within our own app, hr applications and we're live on all of our applications as you would expect but we have something called a skills cloud and yeah. it's really how you capture skills, put them in a common language. And, and I would say this is one of the hottest topics that all of our customers have right now, too, is, you know, tracking, growing and retaining, you know, and, and retaining um, skills within their organizations for their people and their careers. And so we're going to use that skills framework to really look across the CSMs and help them specialize. And then, you know, it helps not only their career pathing. And, and, and growth aspirations, but it all really helps us be a little bit more, I, I hate to use the word scientific, but a little bit more scientific about how we're utilizing our resources and how we're um, um, in, um, incenting our teams to grow as well. I love that. And are you, do you have a role that's the specialist role then that's a different term? Like what, what do you call the person that's not this, the client facing you know, CSM, but the... Yeah. yeah, right now we pull them from different parts of the business. So um, for some of our acquired companies, they're actually CSMs in those in, in those, those organizations. organizations. And yeah. then in some cases, you know, they'll pull in our professional services team yeah. um, or or peer CSMs that, you know, they know are super strong in, in, in various areas or our products organization. I, you know, we have a very generous um, products team that's willing to um, jump into situations when we need to. And then we also have an expert services organization that helps us as well. That's interesting. Yeah. So because CSM can't be on their own. They, they've got to be right. supported by the rest of the org. Do you do anything to like drive that sense of collaboration? Because obviously sometimes you can say, oh, these are my accounts. I, I want to work on my accounts. I'm not going to help on your accounts. And Workday has a great culture, so you probably don't deal with that too much, but it can creep in. How, how do you handle that? You know, we don't have 
we don't have too much of that here, to yeah, be honest. I, I, like, I can tell because you're just um, mission driven, right? Yeah, everybody's yeah. pretty, you know, in most cases, rose in the same direction. Yeah, um, that's awesome. And I will say it's it is one of the most incredible things, and probably one of the reasons I've I've loved being here for so long is that you see that in the energy, and you could ask our sales organization the same the same thing too. The energy to help them do That's their amazing. jobs. Everybody is willing to jump in probably too much. So I'll, I'll tell you a quick story is that um, when COVID first hit and we were trying to, you know, get ourselves together on how to respond, we first kind of made sure customers were confident that, you know, we had everything up and running. We'd, there'd be no blips in the service. But then we kind of made a call to action to our teams and said, come up with ideas on how we can help these customers. Our biggest issue was that we had so many ideas incoming from the CX organization, from products that it just took like a small army just to organize and prioritize those because wow. everybody wanted to help out. Um, and, and so that just gives you a flavor for, you know, everybody is all in when it comes to to doing what they can for our customers. I love that. You know, it's interesting. It's a great lesson for people watching because obviously there's a lot of times people want the magic answer in terms of organizational structure, compensation. Nothing beats a culture that actually cares about your customers, which is probably the hardest thing to do. That's what your founders did way back when, right? Yeah. But um, it's a, that's really inspirational. Um, operationally, so, you know, net retention obviously involves, you know, multiple products. It involves the CS team, clearly involves the sales team as well. How do you think about who owns net retention within Workday? Well, it would probably be um, like, I think the company owns it, right? Yeah, we right. work for a SaaS company, so we pretty yeah. much all better all be behind net retention. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, logistically, it's owned by the customer based sales organization and the customer yeah. success team, right? And, and um, sales org reports into sales. Yep. Is a, a direct partner to your team, basically. Yep. Yeah. So I have a counterpart. His name's yeah. Doug Robinson. He runs all of global sales. Yeah. And then his his teams are obviously organized um, geographically, regionally. And then he's got um, net new sales reps that sell to brand new customers. And then he's got customer based sales reps. And um, we purposely kind of align at all levels, kind of VP level and below to the customer based sales team. We have shared compensation metrics um, around NRR and GRR, um, ironically. And um, and then we have some additional SAT metrics in there for our team. But, um, and so really we partner in the accounts and in, I, that's what I've learned too, kind of as, as we've matured both organizations, really clear lines of accountability and then really understanding all the different teams you can pull in and who will take point on pulling those in. For example, you know, we need a value realization study. Yeah, yeah. Who's going to own that piece, right? So, and that also how we can use other resources efficiently without all of us kind of going after the same resources or frustrating other team members because we're kind of coming at them haphazardly. So we yeah, partner on the accounts. Yep. And then um, I would say, you know, the, I, the customer success manager owns the journey up to renewal. Yep. Ensuring that the customer's happy, they're using their applications, they've got a strategic roadmap planned. The customer based sales organization, they own the upsell of applications right. and they own the renewal transaction. That's great. And I think this, if for folks kind of trying to unpack how this applies in your organization, I think you know, several things you've done really well. One is um, beyond having great culture, is actually having this customer based sales org. So you're, the people in that org care a lot about what your team works on, right? Because at the end mm -hmm. of the day, if your team's not doing the stuff that they're trying to do, they can't be successful with those expansions. And then it sounds like you organize your team in a way that you can map directly this CSM team maps to this customer based sales team. Is that, am I hearing that? That right? is true. We do that on the net new side too. And I would say that's another key difference at Workday than I've had the experience at other software organizations, it really is a team effort. We also align yeah. our comp metrics on our teams get paid on subscription too. So that way we're all, you know, like I said, we're all rowing in the same direction um, and have aligned, you know, organizationally and um, from compensation, et cetera. So the alignment with sales is phenomenal. And, and, you know, the other kind of key partner in crime is obviously the team building the products where he has an incredible innovation engine. What's that um, involvement around net retention vis-a-vis -vis the product team? Yes. Um, so one thing we did um, early on was also build, like I called them an expert services organization. We call it, um, and it has a different name internally, but it's probably the best one to describe it externally. And what we did is we seeded this with um, consultants that had a bunch of 
field experience. They came into this organization. They're responsible actually for creating all the collateral and, and help on our products um, to ramp our 11,000 partners in the ecosystem, to ramp our own team members. And then they're our conduit into the products organization, both us and our partners. And so the way that's done, that's been a really nice way of kind of adding a buffer layer so you don't have all these people going to the products organization. Yeah. Right. It also gives us a really nice consolidation point to say, hey, these are the things that we're seeing from our customers out in the field or from our partners about the products and then helps us really influence the roadmap on behalf of those um, behalf of those inputs. Right. And um, and so that's a really great, um, great mechanism that we use. But I would say, again, like I said earlier, our products organization they're amazing. They're always willing to jump into customer conversation with us to support us, um, you know, take feedback from us and customers on how to improve the products. And, you know, now it's evolved more than just building applications. It's helping build tools for our team. So mm -hmm. how do we track adoption of the applications? How can right. we help our customers benchmark what they're using in Workday against each other? Because that's a question that we get all the time, right? I'm sure you do as well. Yeah. Like, hey, what, who's your best customer, right? Exactly. Besides um, and, um, and so they've, um, you know, we really have a great relationship across the products team and how they help us. And in return, you know, that shows up in, in our, you know, how sticky our products are and our customers buying our really cool new products that they develop. I love that. That's, a, that's such a great partnership. And I, and I can imagine that, that having that buffer allows you to go to the product team instead of having like a thousand different asks from different people, you've got a kind of a rank, it sounds like a ranked list, like what's the most important, what's second, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we have a, we have an external facing thing for our customers right. on community where they can like, community. they can vote yeah. and create brainstorms. But this is another input where we can help rank and say, hey, if you develop this feature, it's gonna help these customers and, and just giving feedback. We also, um, implement all of the new products for them. So we have a new offering launch team. So we're, you know, we're a, a partner to the products organization and always trying out their new products first, making sure we handle those first implementations and mm -hmm. giving them feedback. So it's a nice two-way relationship. Wait, that's awesome. And yeah, I, I find like as a former product person, if you get feedback from a CS team, but it's not ranked in some way, then it's just like adding more stuff on the long pile of things you already have to do. And it's hard, it's not that useful. But if somebody tells you these, these are our top three things for customers. That's it's really valuable. Yeah. Um, and I would add to that the support feedback loop too, right? That's also a really important one that, um, right. that and that's not your org as well, which is, that's more about probably what cause issues and troubleshooting and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So the, the one thing that, you know, Workday I know has, has sort of yeah, done for a long time is ask for feedback from your customers and net promoter score, things like that. How do you find that, that those metrics correlate and matter vis-a-vis -vis net retention? Like, how do you think about an NPS and net retention? I get this question a lot, so I thought I'd uh, see what you think. Oh, wow. That's a good one. Um, I, you know, I, I like surveying customers and getting yeah. that feedback. You know, I think the scores are important, but I also like the written feedback is even more insightful, yeah. right? That's what yeah, I really look forward well. to when we're, yeah. when we're looking at those surveys. Um, you know, in general, I don't, I think they're loosely correlated. And I think, you know, we, we paused on surveying last year, just during the pandemic. We didn't yeah. think it was a great yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, we just picked it up again. And, and I was surprised, you know, it was funny that it was almost like it was still linear from when we'd left off, you know, we got, Ooh. we were really happy with our results. That's awesome. Um, but I, you know, I don't know if it's a huge impact to, to yeah. NPS. I don't have a great, I don't have a great answer for that one for I you. I looked at that across the industry and I think that in general, it doesn't feel like there's a strong correlation, but it's still so useful because I'm sure when you get that feedback, it gives you, like you said, the, the actual comments and the, the input and also being able to jump on a customer issue when they give you, you know, feedback that you need to jump on, right? Mm -hmm. Which we, we do, so. Yeah, I find more nuanced things in the survey feedback yeah. sometimes. Like, hey, you know, you're, your community site, you know, the search is tough on it or something yeah. like, you know what I mean? That's not exactly. really going to drive attrition, totally. but it's impacting, you know, it's like a tiny cut on the experience if that yeah. makes like a paper cut, if that makes it, sense. It makes total sense, especially, you know, for, and for other folks that are building solutions like this, you know, Workday is an enterprise solution. So it's not like somebody on a whim decides to either buy it or to, to not use it. Right. It's a, it's a very considered purchase. So yeah, it's yeah. an investment. Right. And I, that's a great, you know, we need to make sure that our customer that they're living up to the promises that they made to their executives when they bought our application. That's another way that, you know, we talk about it with my, with the team is, 
You know, a lot of people bet their careers when you spend, you know, significant totally. dollars on a solution and you need to make sure that you're helping that person that that customer look good. I love that. <laughs> I, we talk about that all the time. It's, it's not just about customer success for the company. It's about the individual, right? Yeah. Uh, so one of the, one of the last kind of topics I want to dive into is, you know, now I, I feel like one of the, one of the things all SaaS companies owe to companies like Workday is just gratitude because you all blaze the trail, right? Back in when Workday was launched, SaaS is a concept, all these best practices, none of that existed. Um, <laughs> and you've sort of had to figure it all out in some ways on your own. Um, now, the great thing is somebody starting a company, you know, being a first time customer success leader watching this right now, they get to benefit of all the experience, all the things that work, but also whatever challenges and, and stuff like that. So if you were advising a CS leader on setting their metrics, and let's say they're a, you know, 50, 100 person company, early stage company, what would you tell them to look at uh, from the beginning? Yeah, um, I would say, and I think I've said that I, you have to focus on the basics first. Yeah, um, and start measuring at that level um, because you know how's your onboarding experience, how's your deployment experience, right. how are you, you know, how do you how do they feel about your partners that are implementing your solution? Right. How much control yeah. do you have over that? You know. Um, and I would say, you know, I think it's interesting. We just talked about surveys, the good and bad, but some of the surveys are super important, especially at those different stages, those really important milestones at a customer. And I, you can always, you know, pull back later if you're surveying too much and just be mindful of that. But I think that's really important to get a sense as, as you know, they're going through the journey with you, where you can take measurements. And um, part of that is talking to your customers about why they bought your solution. So understanding those value drivers and measuring after, you know, a before and after go live, first of all, with your solution, are you achieving the value metrics or yeah. the TCO that you, that your customer signed up to? I think that's a great baseline before you kind of jump to, I mean, it's, of course, it, you know, your, your revenue, your backlog of your revenue, yeah. you know, all the stuff that you would eventually report to the street, like that is really important. But you need to kind of come up, those are leading indicators of yeah. how that's going to sort out before you get there, right? And I think that would be the first thing I would look at that's in terms really, of the metrics I'm setting up. And I think there's a few nuggets in there because, you know, obviously getting the product deployed is critical and all that. But like you said, that measurement of outcomes and value pre and post is a newer, people weren't doing that five, six years ago. You, you all might have been, but most people weren't doing that, you know. Um, and another one that I heard for, from your story is, just looking at it as an entire journey, right? Like I think that's your, your job, right? Like you said in the beginning of the introduction is your job is to pull together this journey and make it more integrated. What I'm finding is more and more early stage companies are saying we need somebody thinking about the whole journey, whether you call them a chief customer officer or something else, we don't want a siloed, fragmented customer journey. Yes. And it doesn't matter who owns the pieces of that journey, yeah, right? That's what exactly. I've learned here too, is like, there's a lot of it that I don't own that are marketing organization oh, or sales yeah. organizations, but I feel like it's my job to kind of look out for those hot spots and advocate on behalf of customers. And I would say, you know, to your point a second ago, Nick, and one of the things that I probably learned too late in my job, <laughs> you know, but was, you know, we kept looking from our perspective and, and as opposed to, and it sounds so simple, but stepping outside and saying, how is our customer experiencing this? Yes. Like, you know, having my team walk me through the onboarding experience, pretend like you have no idea who I am. And I think I've got mystery shopping. Like back when I was young, somebody would say, come in and, and shop our store and then write a review, right? And then, so I want to mystery shop my own experiences as, as I'm a customer of Workday to see really how it's landing with them. I think that is such a valuable exercise for you to say, oh, wow, that's like, you know, I just filled out like a three page long email. That's not a great experience. And and, <laughs> and then I, you know, so that along with like eating feedback from employees and customers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and snacks, like you have to get out there and hear from your customers, hear from your employees and their roles. How are you making it hard for them? What are things that they would change on behalf of their customers? I think all those are so important as you're kind of building your business. I love it. All right, let me close out with some word association. Just first thing that comes to mind uh, to leave people some memories. So uh, churn. Butter. Butter. Okay, great. Awesome. Not much, not much customer churn happening work day. Net retention. Uh, it's critical. Critical. Customer success. Uh, gosh, I don't know if I have a single word. Um, customer success. They rock. They rock. Okay, yeah. great. That's, 
Kudos to the team there. Yeah. Uh, work, work day. What word comes to mind when you hear the word work day? It's family. Family. That was I easy love for it. Me. Mm -hmm. I can tell. I can tell. And then finally, uh, your your Clemson Tigers. <gasps> I'm so excited for football season. That, oh. that is more than like one word. I'm so excited for football. It's coming up. I'm going to a game this fall, so I'm super excited about that. And are you a Jacksonville Jaguars fan now with Trevor Lawrence? Oh, being you know, I've been watching him warm up. I know, that would, It's tough for me. I will watch him play, but I don't know if I'm going to – I'm not a pro football. We've talked before. I'm not like a pro football person. I'm going to, you know, watch college ball. I love it. Well, SEC football, nothing better. So, mm -hmm. so awesome talking to you. I'm leaving. always so inspiring. And we really admire the Workday culture in particular. And clearly that's the center of everything you talked about. So thanks to everyone for watching today. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks for having me, Nick. Thank you. Bye.